The mighty Celtus Queen is the largest Neopteron in the series. Huge and heavily armoured, she's already a formidable adversary. But she also has an extra trick up her sleeve. The far smaller males of the species are completely bent to her will, devoting themselves to her as mates, soldiers, or even food. Let's unpack this complex relationship, as well as other aspects of their behaviour and ecology. So obviously, one of the most notable things Celtus and Queen do is the sexual cannibalism, which makes for a good springboard to leap into the duo as a whole. Before we begin, it should be noted that there's no guarantee that much of the combo moves the two use are for mating purposes. Outside of the combat that is the core gameplay, it does seem like the most likely lore explanation for such things like the pheromonal attraction, as well as the queen eating her drones likely being made to invoke images of cannibalism as it's well known in arthropods like spiders. So with that sorted, one thing that already puts Celtus in a bad position in this regard is the great sexual dimorphism between the two. As well as numerous morphological differences, the queen is well over triple the mass of her subordinate males, and this is one thing that can lead to such cannibalism. It's a lot easier to eat someone when they can't put up much of a fight, and such dimorphism is often a key predictor in spiders as to whether they exhibit sexual cannibalism too. But other than just snacking, what are the likely reasons for Celtus queens to be so huge relative to their mates? And the chief reason is likely fecundity, which is to say successful reproductive ability. Bigger females can make more and slash or healthier and slash or larger offspring. And it's believed to be a chief reason for greater female mass in animals where the female is the larger sex. And especially in invertebrates too. It's unknown quite how Celtus reproduce, and whilst very rare, case-selected invertebrates do exist. But no matter what the style, the huge size of Celtus queen likely allows them to create more offspring. Offspring sex is apparently dictated by the amount of resources available to the mother in Celtus too. And this also fits. It suggested the larger female invertebrates are more sensitive to environmental changes, and the larger female offspring will also need a lot more time and resources to grow. This is also a factor of a lot of invertebrates having vastly larger females. The females take much more time on each developmental stage, known as an instar, and also have more instars than the smaller males. With this almost certainly being the case for Celtus too, the offspring's sex selection would make sense. In poorer times, whipping up a batch of low-effort males to still achieve some fecundity, and spread your genes, and then producing the more costly, slow-growing females when there are sufficient resources. This huge dimorphism is also what we'd probably expect to see in giant insects too. As invertebrate body sizes grow, so too does the extent of the dimorphism between the species. Celtus queens are very large invertebrates indeed, likely the largest Neopterans to date, and likely greater in mass than the Temnesaron Rachnacadaki, so their pronounced size difference makes sense, as well as Rachna and her tiny pedomorphic males. We also see this in Vespoids too, with the queens being far larger than the standard drones. We don't know what's going on with Nursilla male and female wise, and we've never seen a male at all car, but it's probable the males may also be smaller for them too. Another reason to eat your mate is simply good old fashioned hunger, and after all, this behaviour is seen through the utilisation of the stamina mechanic, so simple hunger can be as good a reason as any. But there does have to be some pre-existing bedrock for the behaviour to occur, after all, it's not like in the couplings of Teostra and Lunastra, or Rathalos and Rathian, that one kills and eats the other when exhausted. For a female to decide to eat her partner follows a relatively simple analysis. Are you worth more as a mate, or as the energy I could get from eating you? Hence why a lot of the eating occurs post-mating when the male has already spent himself as a mate, and may as well be a post-coital snack. Whilst desert Celtus queens may often use their subordinates as projectile weapons against the hunter, it's possible this behaviour originated with them too. Whilst a lot of species that engage in sexual cannibalism will do so anyway, it can be a lot more common in food-deprived females as one would expect with them and their mate-versus-eat choice. In some spiders, malnourished or food-deprived females will readily attack and eat their mates even before mating, with the extra nourishment often being important to breeding success. 
So with this info, in the arid desert areas where food may be comparatively thin on the ground, the desert queens may engage in cannibalism even more frequently than their more messic counterparts, due to lessened prey densities. Desert queens may also use their pheromones to summon males purely for food reasons, over any intention of mating too, or even actively forage for them. There are a few other things that can factor into this as well. Females of species that have already mated are also much more likely to eat males too, and some studies suggest males may have worthwhile proteins that can help egg or young development. So again, queens may lure in males with only one intention that doesn't bode well for their partner. But should a Celtus queen go out foraging and find the shops fresh out of boyfriends, it's worth asking what they may feed on otherwise. And for both desert and regular Celtus queens, the crabs may be a frequent snack here. With considerable overlap with hermitors, they may make up a significant chunk of Celtus queen diet with their considerable numbers. As said in both the Cephadrome and Espinas video, with their reliable annual production of huge numbers of young that provide prey at all sizes, Hermitors may be a very ecologically important species in some areas, and especially deserts where they may support the schools of Cephalos too. Celtus Queen is well equipped to hunt them. With smell and pheromones being important to the pair as a species, the Queen may well be able to sniff out buried Hermitors, and with either her tail or hooked claws, can drag them free from the sand or dig down after them. In short, no escape. Another less numerous prey is possibly shrouded Nursilla. Back in Nursilla's video, I suggested she may be trying to avoid a predator that tracks mainly via smell, and the corpse coat camouflage is an attempt to try and throw it off the scent. And Celtus Queen is a good candidate. The queens are unlikely to hunt anything especially fast, being one of the slowest large monsters and are likely to specialise in slower prey that try to hide as their first mode of defence. It's mentioned Shrouded Narcilla will also make sand traps like ant lines to catch prey in, but these will also shelter Narcilla from the heat of the day and hide her from predators. Again, Desert Celtus Queens are good at sensing things hidden beneath the sand and often seem to forage this way. Plus, the long, grabbing tail of the queen also checkmates Nursilla's long sishorns by keeping her at tail's length and bashing her on the ground to stun her. In short, Celtus queens do seem to be the likely candidate driving many of Nursilla's adaptations. Celtus queen isn't the only likely predator, nor the only stimuli, and there's likely a suite of factors that made Nursilla Nursilla but the giant queens may give some partial explanation of some of Nursilla's more extravagant behaviours. Male Celtus are effectively the opposite, and are very swift, agile flyers with sharp raptorial forelimbs like those of mantids. Whilst male Celtus may well take other invertebrates like hornetors or vespoids, their speed and flight likely also mean they can take fleshier, more common vertebrate prey too. Remobras and other wing drake like animals can be hawked on the wing and taken fairly easily, and they're not above taking ground based prey as shown by their attacks on the hunter. Negative interactions with people are likely predatory in nature, and Celtus likely also takes small animals like Kelby, moss swine, and smaller raptorial bird wyverns too. Outside of protecting the face in combat, the huge forelimbs of the queens still have hooked ends that can be used to both climb and hook potential prey to pull it free from a substrate, but their most likely use is digging. Being huge and spade-like, Celtus queens are excellent excavators for both foraging and burying themselves to escape hot daytime temperatures, and may potentially bury eggs or young too. Another reason desert Celtus males may stay relatively close to the female is she may inadvertently assist in foraging. As the Celtus queen digs, either to escape the heat or find prey, she likely dislodges smaller animals resting in the sand that the Celtus can capture. We see this in Calapa crabs, more commonly known as the shamefaced crab, who seems to be one of Celtus Queen's inspirations. As they dig for mollusks, wrasse, and other fish feed on whatever gets dislodged here too. Hence, desert Celtus may often be within tail's reach of their queen for when she's out foraging for herself, disturbing small animals like Delex that could be potential prey. Sexual cannibalism can also occur for another reason too, which is aggressive spillover. This is loosely where a female of the species that has swift, aggressive behaviours with prey, and the bite first, ask questions later mindset, is more likely to eat their potential mate. 
Celtus and queen are also well suited to this as it's less harmful in species where males greatly outnumber the females as Celtus do. The way the queen pulls new mates out of the sand gives some overlap between courtship and foraging behaviours, and this, combined with aggressive spillover, may be one attribute for the frequency of this behaviour. In a similar vein, the Celtus cannon manoeuvre may well be brought out from the stress of harassment from the hunter, and be something of an unnatural move. Technically, it's a waste of both a mate and food, and may well be born from the stress, harassment, and lengthy attacks of the hunter rather than something a queen would normally do with her subordinates. Overall, it's worth noting there can be multiple overlapping reasons for invertebrates to practice sexual cannibalism, and it can be a combination of several factors over purely one of them. Mate choice may also factor into things, and it's never too late to change your mind on the viability of a partner and eat them instead. Poor sexual performance can potentially be one such cause of cannibalism. In some spiders, it's believed they can evaluate sperm numbers in copulation, and if the male is giving insufficient readings, then he gets eaten. Know your worth, queen. Similarly, generally defective males that show up hopeful can be consumed too. But the queen can at least partially rely on the Celtus males to filter themselves as well. Celtus's signature feature is perhaps their impressive horn, a single spearhead-like point on the normal males and a two-pronged fork on the desert males. Part of the difference may well come from the environment and how it affects their queen here. If we assume Celtus joust with their horns, and the stronger, more well-armed male displaces the lesser individual, then Desert Celtus's fork may well be due to female scarcity. The lesser resources in the desert likely result in lesser numbers of females, and so females are guarded more intensely by the males. This could have caused the divergence, as it could be argued the larger fork is better suited to true tests of prolonged strength with both males interlocking and wrestling and allowing a more definitive winner, but with lesser risk of random impalement. In some rhino beetles, horn morphology in the species can differ in a population depending on the amount of females too. Scarce females result in large horned males who intensely guard their feeding patches, whereas abundant females result in smaller horns due to the lessened importance of fighting. Normal Celtus may not be quite such jealous partners, and may be more willing to take the L and move on in the hopes of finding another more reasonably abundant female. Such a semi-nomadic life may be one reason why Celtus's horn isn't even larger. Bug armaments do vary. Rhinoceros beetle horns are actually surprisingly cheap to carry around, whereas stag beetle jaws are pretty expensive. But Celtus still needs to retain a certain level of speed and agility for both predator and anti-predator flight. That likely puts a realistic cap on how big the horn can get. Unsurprisingly, larger horns do often win more fights and result in a more successful male. But this counts for little if you've starved or already gotten eaten. Only up until a point though too. Larger horns get structurally weaker, and so both types of Celtus we see may be in a sweet spot in terms of mobility, size, and weight. Such weaponry still has mechanoreceptors, so engagements can be ended before something gets broken, as a Celtus with broken horns may as well be castrated. If the males don't do a good enough job themselves, the queens may filter them further based on their physical attractiveness. Sexual cannibalism can occur when males lack the proper morphological traits to be viewed as a good match. So even a victorious Celtus with insufficient horns could be eaten on arrival. Similarly, any that win a fight but break a horn in doing so likely then eagerly fly to their doom. Fighting isn't reserved for just the males though and Celtus queens may use their long tails in combat with each other too. Earwigs will also use their forceps like appendages in combat, and the larger males also tend to have larger forceps in a trait known as intraspecific allometry, that larger individuals can develop larger secondary sexual characteristics. Size remains the most important trait in such fights, with larger males winning contests full stop. But between smaller males, forceps size can make all the difference in combat. So with all else being equal, weaponry may close the gap in a contest between two Celtus queens. Desert Celtus queens especially have more pronounced forceps, and this may be for a double role. One of more foraging in the deeper substrate of sand, and two due to the more intense competition over lesser resources. 
The tail can also be successfully used against other enemies too, and any weapon that creates space between you and your attacker with less risk to yourself is a good one, and jabs can be aimed especially at soft eyes and undersides. The huge cella-like forelimbs seem to be used chiefly for protection when in combat, with the queen protecting their faces and mouthparts from damaging strikes delivered by other large opponents. Overall, a Celtus Queen likely lives up to her title of Heavy Armor Bug, and is a walking fortress near immune to predation. Another form of defense too is her notable stench, and Celtus Queens can expel a foul-smelling vapor so severe it nauseates the hunter out of eating anything further. This isn't just an extra tool at her disposal should something breach her defenses, but may also be co-opted from the Queen's occasional pheromone spreading. Whilst it's often mentioned as her controlling the Celtus, there's not really much need to do so here. In Eusocial Insects, it's debated whether this behaviourally changes workers not to breed or outright causes them to go sterile. But in the far less social Celtus, all the Queen really needs to do is call them to her attention. She doesn't have workers she has to compete with, only her drones she needs to summon. Upon summoning and being grabbed, the males are doused heavily with a release of pheromone, which is to say one that causes rapid changes in behaviour. This seemingly causes the male to tightly grasp the top of the queen's carapace, and react with hostility to anything nearby. The complete synergy the two seem to have may just be the drone simply reacting to different stimuli. If the aggressor is far away, he flies the queen closer. If the aggressor is in striking distance, he uses the forelimbs to attack. If the queen charges, he lowers his horn. In ants, it's suggested that the pheromone doesn't cause the attack itself, but rather behaviorally primes the ants to act aggressively when the threat does occur. Dousing an aggressor with it may not just cause a vile smell, but also trigger nearby Celtus to attack. Even if Celtus aren't hugely powerful, a swarm of them constantly attacking would be a deterrent to any monster. For invertebrate monsters, it may also have another effect. When Drosophila, which is to say pretty asocial fruit flies, are exposed to honeybee queen mandibular pheromone, they become sexually attentive and try to locate it. It's unknown if this works on other buggy monsters too, and to what extent, but Celtus queens leaving a trail of their pheromones may well bring lunch to their doorstep. Such strong chemical defences fit with trends in entomology with large and long-lived insects often being the ones to use it due to their greater permanence in the landscape, and possibly the need to cause lasting memory in potential predators of how bad they are to eat, even on an individual level, it being just one of a suite of factors that give the Celtus and their queen a lasting foothold in the land of the Wyverns. So for thoughts on Celtus and queen, I think they're both excellent monsters. Celtus just generally wins the crown of best starter monster for me. An opening with a bug was pretty refreshing too. Early game for you in general has a pretty nice feeling of a lot of what you fight being giant, exaggerated versions of things you might readily encounter in the nearby countryside, like bugs, frogs, snakes, crabs and monkeys, before you level up and get to dragons and wyverns. Celtus Queen 2 was already pretty decent, and one thing I always enjoyed was the real sense of weight her animations had, as well as the fact they were all bespoke for her. But obviously the addition of her combining with Celtus really was the cherry on the cake, and the main talking point. It keeps Celtus relevant in the later game, something no other starter monster has really achieved. It improves Celtus Queen's fight in a unique, fun and dynamic way, and really fleshes them both out as living creatures too. In short, the two just do everything right as monsters. With a good fight, design, ecology, and gear, it's hard not to like them. On an individual level, Nursilla still remains my favourite buggy monster, but Celtus and Queen as a whole are worth more than the sum of their parts. The two also feel like they could have some really interesting turf wars with their combination mechanic too, so may we see them again as soon as possible in glorious updated graphics in the next mainline game. For the future in general, more inverts are ripe for the picking for monster huntification. Grasshoppers, dung and rhino beetles, dragonflies, centipedes, a cool scorpion monster. One that's actually good of course. The list is pretty endless on how they can be adapted and applied. Who knows what we may see in future. 
Thanks for watching, especially to top patron Phenomenon for their continuing support, as well as Kay Sandum, Big Al, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Sassy Birdo, Tristan Berry, Inventory Overflow, Evilly, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zaysir, Karazal, Dodecablos, and Bazugazu Bakohatsu Bakomatsu for their ongoing kindness in keeping the channel going. If you're interested in supporting it yourself, there's a link in the description to the Patreon. And I'm always grateful for anything you think you can give. Likes, shares and subscriptions are always appreciated as well. A big thanks to Carmen Rider Moten for providing her custom digital artwork for this piece. And if you're interested in more snapshots of Monster Life, then there's plenty more on her assorted social media that you can follow her on too. And also a huge thanks to T Common Shark for bringing my theory of Desert Celtus Queen hunting Shrouded Nursilla to life with one of their typically excellent animations. Be sure to follow them if you're not already for plenty more like it. So in response to the last few videos, thanks for all the positive comments on the last two. Clearly I'll have to revisit the wastelands and cover those horrible, horrible Cazadors as well. More Specivo shorts to come whenever they do as well. One thing people mentioned in the herbivore video, that herbivores should have more mortalities with people due to encounter rates, but not necessarily. When you think about the limited range of something like a bison, versus that of a cougar or black bear, the latter two spend far more time in incredibly close proximity to people, yet still fail to rack up similar attacks. Same with leopards in India that literally live in cities versus the more rural elephants. So it's probably more equal or maybe more in favour of the carnivore most of the time. Even if herbivores will typically have more biomass in an ecosystem, less influenced by people. The environment video caused a lot of good questions that deserve some discussion. One of which was, should old maps keep coming back? And after a long thought, my answer was actually no. Other than the forest and hills, which I think should earn it as the literal OG map, I would much rather get new ones. I do love a lot of the old maps, having said before that my favourite is the first gen swamp, but everything the swamp did that was good can easily be made into its own map complete with the crystal studded caves, foggy woodlands, open mires and the sedge field, and making a new one would make for better made, more cohesive maps with new and old monsters getting environmental interactions for it rather than just old maps getting twisted and tortured into the new open maps that already put limitations on things. In Sunbreak, the second gen jungle still generally succeeded, with the original having a relatively small scope and clear pathways between area zones, as well as room for expansion like being able to enter the island temple. Sunbreak generally delivered on reviving it well, but other maps use the loading screens and skyboxes to portray a small area of a far greater landscape, and this can be lost in their adaptations. Whilst it's all up to opinion, I and a fair few others felt the sandy plains and flooded forest were mere shadows of their former selves in Rise. It's also just somewhat sad that the first game to truly make its maps for its monsters, later had them cannibalised to service the hunter only. A lot of the older maps too aren't hugely distinctive or memorable. Can anyone really say they want the second gen desert back? Or any of the old volcanoes? Or that the snowy mountains has any real advantages over the tundra or frozen seaway? There are some, like the misty peaks, that have biomes that haven't really been replicated. But again, these can be spiritually remade in a new map of the same biome. Another was how the Hoarfrost Reach fitted into things. Overall, I think the Reach is a great map, and the best snow map to date, and did allow for Barrioth to be relatively well restored as a fight. The general trio of Barrioth, Banborough, and Beatodus also weren't bad, although Viper felt a bit out of place. Should have been Giganox, really. The fact some monsters intended for the Reach became invaders did weaken things a bit, and overall it felt like a diet version of the world ethos, but overall it was still pretty decent. It was also pointed out to me that DOS does in fact still use analog sticks, which I assumed no one in their right mind would continue with, but here we are. On that note, someone also asked why seasons weren't included too, and as far as my understanding goes, seasons were effectively changes to the RNG of DOS like monster stats, map opening times and gathering. So whilst a fairly organic change to gameplay, this isn't a huge different to the actual maps themselves, and was prior to much monster interaction with them. 
I do think seasons have truly enormous potential. If done with dynamic maps that change significantly and physically with the season, and monsters built around the season concept, as well as modifying some that already have this in their lore, like Mizutsune and Black Diablos. But as it stands now, it didn't feel notable enough to bring up. I should also point out that I don't dislike elders. Most of them. But in a video focusing on monster interactions with their maps, elders were always going to come up short in that particular topic when they were made to be partially nomadic and somewhat different to other monsters in that they were less involved in nature. In earlier titles, elders always had a role of a certain mystery about them, that was somewhat shifted into them being mega powerful ecosystem destroyers, that was somewhat bucked in world with Valhazak who's more of a peaceful gardener than anything else, and Nagagante who's said to somewhat restore the natural order. A lot of the emphasis is now still more on the over-the-top theatrical strength and powers, and it could be worth noting more Val-style elders could ultimately wind up making more interesting and unique elders for the future. Unless you're a certain fat dinosaur, stupid monkey, or weeb tiger, power in Monster Hunter rarely lasts. And if you have nothing else interesting about you when it's trumped, often by said fat dinosaur, stupid monkey, or weeb tiger, then you're effectively left with nothing special. Giving elders something to do other than be cool and strong could help them in the long run, because that whole epic power thing is really starting to curdle for them. And as for who'll be covered in the next video, as picked by the patrons,